I knew nothing at all about Gabriel until I met him, which was during the first session. I hadn't even seen him. He's one of our longest um, students, I believe, isn't he? I think so. Yes, and uh, seven or eight years. Yeah, seven or eight years. He's, he's uh -huh. actually been here, yeah. and uh, within within that time, he has been one of the most well, one of the students that we find the hardest to communicate with. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's one of the reasons mm. why, obviously, Phoebe's here. Our senses may work perfectly well, but on the way to the brain, it gets scrambled. And this is very often the case with people with autistic spectrum disorder. It's not the brain itself so much as on the way to the brain. So that the messages and information which come in are interpreted wrongly. So their perception of reality is different to our perception of reality. Now that is really, really important because one of the problems we have is that we tend to assume that other people's perception of reality is the same as ours. He was very, very locked into his own world, completely ignoring people, locked into his repetitive behaviours in a way that didn't offer much access. He's diagnosed as having autism yeah. and um, he's got a um, severe learning disability mm. and severe epilepsy. He spent a lot of time walking around doing his own repetitive behaviour oh, and other things. Yeah, he's on his own agenda. If his pattern is disrupted, mm. he may show some behaviours. He's unable to join the, the modular programs that yes, we have here, so the designed um, individual program has, has been placed for him. I thought this is going to be very hard, but then that does happen quite often. You know. I sort of feel my way into it, and I try different things. I look for the feedback that the person's giving themselves, and in this case he was fixated on various objects, and I had to look at exactly what stimulus he was giving himself. And in fact, when I looked carefully, it turned out that an awful lot of his flicking was not just flicking, but was tapping onto his um, uh, left hand with a fairly specific rhythm. And I started tapping him with his rhythm um, so that he got a related feedback, which his brain recognised, and he started to be... Um, interested in what I was doing as well as what he was doing. The first motion is here, isn't it, actually? That's where he's, that's where he's stimulating himself. If it's the string or whatever it is, it's, it's always rubbing that. So what I really need to do is get into that. If our points of view are limited or distorted, the world around us must be very confusing or scary. A lot of the people that we work with are in this situation, the ones that we can't communicate with. They tend to focus on their inner world rather than the world outside because that's too confusing or scary. That very often ends up in repetitive behaviours where people are listening to themselves, they are self-stimulating. What happens when people are in a repetitive loop is that they tend to focus on the inner world. What we're going to try and do is to shift their attention from the inner world to exchange with the world outside. We're going to try and shift their attention from solitary style stimulation to shared activity. What we need to ask is, what does a person with autism experience? What is their reality? 
How can we actually modify the difficulties they're having? How can we actually help them? We have to look at what is meaningful for that particular person and work from that. You are looking for the thing that has meaning for them and you are using that to get access to their inner world and draw their attention to interaction rather than solitary self-stimulation. I started to work with his string flickers. What I'm looking for is things which actually have meaning for him so that um, I am responding to the things that he does so that he knows that when he does something he gets a response which is meaningful for him in his own language, in, on his terms. When you sat down next to him for the first 20 minutes and you were echoing back what he was doing mm -hmm. uh, with the flickers and yeah. everything like that, and eventually he, might, he, he showed some form of interest. The interesting thing is that I noticed when I was working with him that an awful lot of even his flickers are actually um, aimed at his hand um, and that he's actually getting some physical stimulation and in fact where he's giving himself that meaningful feedback it is um, very often that he's touching his hand. You look at what they're doing and you do it with them and that says I value what you're doing. And so we can join in these activities and then they're surprised to see their activities happening somewhere else and it gradually leads their attention from that inner world to the world outside. But as soon as you start to use the language with a person which they are using with themselves, they will start to respond. I worked with the vibrator. He liked that very much indeed, he was very interested in it, a bit too interested in so at not only having one, I was a problem of how to actually use it for interaction with him. Um, he was very interested in trying to stand it up, it was a bit, it was a bit unstable. Aww. Balancing is one of the things which um, you could tap into, though it's quite difficult that, because as you see, as soon as I intervened with that one, he didn't actually want to balance, he wanted to control it. It was about controlling uh, what was going on. What he didn't do was actually give us the feeling that he completely finished with it. He wasn't interested that you know, it at all. That was it. Just underneath? Yes, well, you know, we, we might be able to get it up. He did get it standing up in the end, didn't he? So we got some blue tech and stand it up for him, and he just didn't want to know, and he walked out of us. <laughs> Big there. Ah, it's going to be a question of a certain amount of luck. I know now that I can do it with him, which is at least one of them, which is something. It's a question of getting it right. And also, of course, his epileptic status. What we've got is him being interested in something, but what I want him interested in, the person he's working with, we had about half an hour of him running around doing various things, flicking and so forth, and I was getting um, slightly wondering whether we were going to be able to get through to him. We need to know what people are getting out of these repetitive behaviours. Now, suppose you live in a world which is totally unpredictable. Let's take this room. You are the bits in a kaleidoscope, and this is the kaleidoscope, the room which is going round and round and round and round, and you are the bits swirling around. That reality is different to the reality, their sensory experience of the world is different from the reality that we experience. They live in a chaotic sensory world. When they do their particular things they're fixated on, turning the lights on and off, or ripping up paper, or whatever, they actually know what they're doing, because that, it's as if that, their own language is hardwired in. It doesn't break up and cause them the sensory chaos, therefore it's not threatening. If I'm stroking my arm, I'm giving myself sensation, I'm wallowing in that sensation, basically. 
It excludes the world outside. When I do that, I know what I'm doing because the world outside is so confusing and so disturbing and in some cases painful. There's a guy called Sean Barron who wrote a book called There's a Boy in Here. And he said, when I switched the light switches on and off, it gave me the wonderful sense of security because I knew what was going to happen. It was exactly the same each time. You begin to notice the attention intensifies and they'll begin to do something and then wait for your response. And that's the point at which you know that they know that if they do something they will get a response which is meaningful for them. What happens when I echo back somebody's breathing rhythm? What the brain says is, yes, I recognize that. That is a stimulus that I actually recognize, but I didn't do it. No matter how profoundly a person is disabled, they always recognize their own signals, the ones that are familiar to them. And they can distinguish between that sound made by me and that sound made by somebody else out there. They can always make that distinction. It's like a secret doorway, or to put it in more contemporary language, it's like a personal code which you have to get hold of and then you can key it in to get access to that person. It's extremely rare, really very rare indeed, that there's no way of getting through to a person. I've worked with over a thousand people in the last six years and I would say about 12 of those we haven't been able to make any effective change in at all. When I feel self-conscious it's because I'm focusing on myself and not the person I'm working with and it's actually an extremely good sign so, you know, forget about yourself and all the other people. Yeah. And I make a deliberate shift when I feel that self-consciousness, which I do, mm -hmm. you know. But I know it's a sign that I'm actually not focusing in the way that I should be on the person. I do recommend that when people first try, it's better probably to try on your own with the person so that you're not surrounded by, you know, sceptical people. Because once you start to get a response from them, you will lose that self-consciousness. When we are doing this with a person, we are emptying ourselves, we are giving that person absolute total attention. But when I say emptying myself, I still have to be there for them. I have to respond to them. It's not a question of, you know, me being a, a mirror, exactly. It's of me being a, a living, responding person whose attention is totally focused in that person when I'm working with them. There were times when he he turned his back and he was quite happy for me to join him. He got tired at times and wanted a bit of respite. Other people will say, what about mimicking? You know, isn't it mimicking? Isn't it disrespectful to people? There is a very, very long distance between mimicking a person, which is unpleasant, to valuing a person so much that you take the, the trouble to learn their language so that you can talk to them. If they start to get upset or overexcited, then you've got to go back to actually copying them exactly. Some people who have um, profound multiple <coughs> disabilities actually will interact very well for a little while and then you'll see a sort of glazed look coming over their faces and they'll sort of go off. And you think, oh God, you know, I had it, I lost it. What, what did I do wrong? And in fact, all they need is to rest because, you know, actually it is a way of working that their brain is not used to and they need time to take it on board. They need time to think about it, to assimilate what they've actually done. And so if you wait, they will almost certainly come back and you'll see them sort of, sometimes they'll give a deep sigh. 
Uh, yes, got that. Let's go on. And they'll cheer up again and give you eye contact or whatever. You do need to wait. They actually get tired. So don't expect people to go on too long. One of the problems is we tend to think of doing things in sessions. So we may actually do things much too long with people, when in fact all their capacity is to take quite a short intervention. What's going on in the brain is a sort of heroic struggle, actually, to try and make sense of the environment. he was focusing mostly on a bead so I put a bead on my string and immediately that I started to get the bead on my string he really started to focus in on it um, and uh, he didn't try and grab it for quite a long time and I just um, f flicked my bead and what uh, he, he watched um, and we did this together the interaction is more than just the way we talk to each other, it's a sort of flow which you get, which is almost a sort of bonding. People will say, I've known this person for years, but I've never really known them. And now suddenly they've become a friend and, and, and we are, are in, on, in terms of complete equality suddenly, because we talk an awful lot about equality and valuing people. but. Real equality is when you are using the same language with each other, the same emotional language, and you value each other. Eventually, he started really looking extremely closely at, at my face and inter, in an interactive way and smiling. And um, then I blew in one of his ears as it was, his head was turned away and he turned around for me to do the other one. What I get from them is total attention and we begin to attend to each other and then you get this extraordinary bonding feeling. You never feel quite the same about a person again when you've actually got this sort of response.